Uh, good evening and welcome to the uh, Wednesday, October 10th, 2017 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Would you all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do the roll call, please. Chairman Garvin. Here. Councilor Grennan. Councilor Caitlin Jordan? Here. Councilor Penelope Jordan? Here. Councilor Lennon? Here. Councilor Ray? Here. And Councilor Sullivan? Here. Thank you very much. Um, so our first item up on the agenda um, is a recommendation to enter into executive session for the purposes of uh, continuing um, uh, discussion with our legal counsel concerning the town's rights and duties regarding paper streets that have been under consideration. Um, so I see that there's folks um, gathered here in the hall. Um, we had estimated um, resuming the public session of the meeting um, at approximately 7.45. Um, so um, that's, that's what our plan is. Um, if there's anybody um, before we do that, um, to go just ever so slightly out of order, just in, in the interest of, of not making people wait around. If there's something uh, that you're looking to speak about that's not on the agenda here tonight, I invite you to come forward at this time to do that. Everybody else is here for something that's on the agenda? Okay. With that being said, I'll look for a motion to enter into executive session. Jessica. I move that in conformance with that one MRSA, and I always make this mistake. Sense. Subsection 405, uh, 6E, we enter into executive session. Is there a second? Second. Any, any discussion? All those in favor? Great. So if you'll all bear with us, be patient, or return at about 745 or so, that's our estimated time to resume the session.
thank the council and in the return. Uh, thank you all for your patience. I know we went beyond the estimated 45 minutes that we thought uh, we would need, so I appreciate that. Um, as soon as Council Lennon gets back, we'll um, resume with the rest of the agenda. While she is uh, returning, um, Councillor Penny Jordan was here earlier. Um, uh, she was able to participate in part of the meeting this evening. Um, due to a scheduling conflict, she had to excuse herself for the rest of the rest of the evening here tonight. So, what about Patty? And Patty um, is out of town as well. Um, all right, everybody set? Back to the agenda. Thank you. All right. Um, the first thing I want to point out um, is uh, our upcoming meeting dates. <clears throat> um, we're going to be moving the previously regular, the previously scheduled regular monthly council meeting um, set for November 13th. That is being moved up one week to Monday, November 6th. It'll be at 7 p.m. here in the uh, council chamber. Um, the following Monday, on the 13th, we will still have our 2018 council caucus which will include um, the newly elected um, council members that will be sworn in December. Um, so we will have that caucus meeting here at 7 o'clock uh, in the Jordan Conference Room. Um, with that, we'll go on to the Finance Committee report. Jessica? Um, you've got your dashboard in, front, dashboard in front of you. Um, hang on, We had all heard from uh, Matt Sturgis the good news of the forthcoming payment from Spectrum that we've been waiting for for quite a while, and um, I'll uh, ask him to speak to that. Sure. Uh, yes, uh, as uh, folks have been watching for, for a while, uh, I've realized during the summer and uh, over the spring and the summer, we were being shorted by Charter Communications, Spectrum, Time Warner. Uh, Inadvertently, I guess, would be the nicest way to put it. Uh, I'll trust people at their best behavior. But uh, they had miscalculated what they needed to provide us for the franchise fee. And I guess the, the power of persistence paid off with emails and phone calls on a weekly basis. Uh, finally, I received information at the start of this week that they have verified that our 5% rate that I notified them they needed to be paying us uh, was accurate and uh, had been effective since February 22nd of 2008. And they have entered uh, to provide us the, the over $17,000 uh, that we were short as of last spring. They will be paying it this year, so we should be seeing our check and our compensation for that coming uh, in that amount greater in the spring. So. Uh, I will say for those of you who think that if you stick with something long enough, it pays off, <laughs> it does. So financially, it was a good one for the town. So. Great. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, two things. Yesterday, we both attended the uh, monthly Metro Coalition of Government. This is under the Greater Portland Council of Government. Um, and two very uh, exciting developments. Um, first of all, first one is a... a uh, development or creation of benchmarks that we've been asking for for several years and it's finally happened in which, in which uh, all the communities in the greater Portland area are benchmarked for what they spend in public works, or what they spend per capita for emergency services, things like that. So that's going to be a, a great document going forward to help us as we do our budget work to see where we are in the lineup and what our our spending is uh, as compared to other communities, and that will help us in the future figure out where we can regionalize. So that was exciting. And the other issue uh, is the, the development of, um, it's still in the preliminary stages, but of a fire training facility. Um, this is something else that's been studied for a while. It was studied about 15 years ago, and then it just ended. But the state of Maine doesn't have an official training facility for firemen in emergency. Uh, technicians, they do have a state police academy, but we don't have a place for firemen to, to train. Um, and we are 
as many communities, always desperately looking for qualified and certified personnel, but you need a place to train them. Um, when a facility like that is up and running, it will improve, for example, insurance rates um, for everybody, for those, those employees. Um, so there's a lot that's very exciting about that. I don't think Matt wants to add anything to that. It, it, it is looking at, uh, well, right now they do have some training the facilities that they do in a couple of different towns, but uh, as far as having a large scale uh, facility for that, they are looking at trying, probably trying to establish one over on the Eco Main Brownfields land that they've had. And, uh, they're working with Eco Main, they're very interested in doing that and providing that location for, uh, for a regional training facility. Uh, but there's a little bit of a, a wrinkle in there that there are members of Eco Main who are not part of Cumberland County, but I think that's a, a small concern as far as finding. Uh, you know, the ways forward as far as cost sharing and trying to figure out what the operational cost should be. And there are also members of Eco, uh, there are also members of Eco or who are in Cumberland County who aren't members of Eco Maine. So there's a couple different ways there that, but those are small speed bumps to overcome. But overall, if the facility gets completed, and they're looking at the county as one of the uh, funding models for that because they have the bonding authority, and then they can distribute those costs across the, the 27 towns in Cumberland County or the other users as well. That would be a mechanism that would help possibly speed that going forward. There's also a legislative effort that they have in Augusta that they're trying to find to have the state provide uh, annually a million dollars to the creation and construction of these types of facilities for specifically for fire training. And uh, so it's an exciting development to see this come forward. Uh, it has some traction up until about 2007, 2008, but a lot of things had the traction up until about that time, and then the recession hit. So that kind of put it on the back burner while uh, we were trying to figure it out. But there's definitely, it's exciting if it does get placed, it may also provide to those communities who are a member of that uh, a benefit in their ISO rating, which in turn would end up helping us with our uh, fire insurance rates for the members of, the, of, those, of, the, of those membership towns. So you can see your house insurance go down as a consequence of that. Thank you. And then uh, tomorrow, um, I'll be attending the second of four Cumberland County Finance Committee meetings, so, uh, which has been very good because I'm learning about how that budget is developed, and many of us have been complaining about what we pay the county <laughs> for quite a while, so. Anyway, so thank you. Oh, and uh, I'd ask Matt to tell us briefly about the animal control uh, numbers. I just, you know, this, it's, there are various things in our budget that, you know, we, we don't really know about. I think the animal control one is quite interesting. And if you could just briefly, because I know we're running late tonight. Sure. So. No, happy to. I'll be very brief. Uh, right now, we currently have our animal control officers provided under contract with the town of South Portland, city of South Portland. Uh, we have an annual contract that pays them twelve thousand seven hundred and seventy-six dollars. And over the past year, uh, confirmed this afternoon, there were eighty-eight calls that the animal control officer responded to. So uh, that's that's what we're looking at at this point in time. Uh, in a municipal collaboration between both towns, but that's that's where we're at. All right, thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Jessica? No, I don't. Sorry. Any questions for Jessica? No. I just had a quick announcement. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that the comprehensive plan is hard at work. Um, we're viewing chapters. As you've heard before, you can go to the town main website and click on something if you want to join the chat room called Lumio. There's going to be questions every about two weeks that you can weigh in on. More importantly, um, our public survey is out, and I think everyone in town received a postcard. But I just want to reiterate to everyone here and the listening audience, please take the seven to ten minutes to fill out that survey. It's so important to us. We want to hear it from as many people as possible, all voices, all demographics, all age groups. We're interested in what everyone has to say. Um, and again, it's very, very easy to take, and the link to it is right at the top of the um, Cape Elizabeth home page. So I really appreciate it if everyone would do that. It's, it's important, and we're listening, and we want to hear from you. Thank you. Any questions for Sarah? Any other announcements, correspondence? Um, I will uh, put in a plug for tomorrow night's um, candidates night uh, here at Town Hall. Uh, candidates for both town council and school board will be here tomorrow evening um, in one hour sessions. Is it they're doing school board too? Yeah, just, yeah doing yeah. both. Um, 
and uh, it will be uh, broadcast on uh, the local access channel as well as then archived on the website and rerun on the local access channel as well. So uh, good opportunity to hear from those folks that are running for office in November. Um, if there's nothing else, we'll, um, I'll again offer up uh, opportunity for citizen discussion of anything that's not on tonight's agenda. Um, sure questions. questions. Are there audience questions? Yeah. Oh. Some. Well, what happens is you submit questions. They'll hand you index cards okay. in the back of the room. The usually that's Mr. Ted Jordan takes them, or he has some students that take them. You do not know whether or not your question will be asked, though. It's moderated by the um, high school's AP government class. So, yep. Um, all right, seeing no citizen comment at this point. Matt, your monthly report, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You uh, progress continues on municipal projects in town. Uh, the Hillway and Scott Dyer Road reconstruction and waterline project continues, if you haven't noticed, uh, with an estimated completion date of the start of November. Paving has begun on Hillway with installation of granite and concrete curbing that began today. And the shaping and installation of sidewalks is progressing as well. There are some traffic challenges, that's the understatement of the, week, of the week, on Scott Dyer Road this week at school pickup and drop off times. We, we apologize for that, uh, as there is the occasional reduction down to one lane, and that is uh, a huge challenge. However, you know, all of those involved in the project are really working as fast as we can towards completion and trying to get that through and stop inconveniencing uh, folks as much as we can. The police department is planning a drug drop off at the police station on October 28th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So if you have expired prescriptions or out of use prescriptions, please take advantage of this opportunity. It's been very successful in the past and it's a, it's a good opportunity to get uh, attractive drugs out of your house that have attractions to people for other reasons outside of getting well. So uh, please take advantage of that. First half property taxes are due on October 2nd. And collections are tracking extremely well. Payments are still coming in, but overall, uh, the, the benchmarking study that we just found, we were number two out of uh, all of the greater Portland towns uh, with uh, at 99% uh, collection rate. So uh, hats off to Assistant Town Manager Deborah Lane because uh, she does a great job on that. The new wet team boat has arrived in Portland. It's being outfitted at Portland Yard Services and it should be deployed shortly. Uh, we will have another. Uh, we are looking at possibly selling the old wet team boat. So if you are looking to acquire one, uh, please reach out to the chief. We'd be happy to talk with you about that. Um, I'll be sending a letter to the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry on reaching a cooperative agreement with the state regarding a relocation of the public boat launch at Kettle Cove. Uh, this is in pursuit of the Harbor Committee's charge of long-range plan for access. And finally, I'd like to mention the passing of Audrey Jordan, who was involved in many aspects of Cape Elizabeth as a in the community as a volunteer and a town employee, and our condolences go out to the family. Yeah. That's, all, that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. I can answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for Matt? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Next up, a review of the draft minutes of the September 11th, 2017 meeting. I'll be looking for a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Kathy, seconded by Caitlin. Sure. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you very much. Next up on our agenda, we have a public hearing scheduled for the domestic foul amendments that are included in tonight's agenda, Chapter 12, Miscellaneous Offenses. Um, if you would like to speak about this, uh, when I open the public hearing, please queue up at the podium. Uh, give us your name, your address, or affiliation, and um, please limit your comments to approximately three minutes. So with that, I'll open the public hearing. Anybody wishing to speak on this, please come forward. Hi, my name is Scott Irving. I live down by Crescent Beach, Crescent View. Uh, I actually picked, saw this in the, the Courier and went over and read it. And It's called the Domestic Fall uh, Amendment, but the way it's written, it, is, it actually includes all seven one and a half million animals that exist. Uh, so the change, as you, I'm sure you know, was to pull a list of five specific animals in a sort of a, a wording that simply said grazing animals, and it's probably, I'm going to guess, 40-ish animals all told. 
Um, that specific list in the word grazing was pulled out, which means it's animals, of which there are about seven and a half million. Uh, there's an exception made for dogs, that's the only exception. So cats are included. If somebody still has the hobby of homing pigeons, that those would be included. Um, there's a pretty good sized list of actually things that people might be involved with, but they're, they're now included. I'm not sure that was really intense since it's called the domestic fowl. I mean, I assume this has to do with people keep chickens and problems with that. Uh, so I keep bees. Yeah, someone said to me, well, ins they're insects, they're not animals. Well, they're not. Insects are animals. So the way it's worded, bees are covered. Uh, 100,000 collars and leashes are probably not very practical. Uh, bees have a foraging distance of about three miles, which means somebody in center of town pretty much has to get permission from everybody in town. Uh, that's not very practical. Where I live in the southern end, I have to go about half the town. So I guess my point is it's not terribly specific. It was, I'm, I'm, I can kind of see the attractiveness of doing what they did, but it opens it up to uh, a completely undefined list, pretty much, at, you know, seven and a half million types of animals. Uh, so I guess my request would be to go back and uh, maybe put the types of animals that were really desired to be covered in there. Uh, bees, and I can leave this with you, are, are covered by the state. There's a best management practices uh, document. There are laws that the state has for bees, so they're pretty much covered already. Uh, and all this is going to do is cause problems because all you really need is one person within the three mile range who says, I don't want them on my property and I'm not sure what you do at that point. There's also feral bees, wild bees. Uh, again, I'm not sure how you would distinguish my bees from a wild bee anyways, but uh, it, it just kind of, yeah, I guess my view would make a mess. It would be nice to see the lobby a little more specific and actually to the point of what's desired. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak on this? Last chance. Okay, public hearing is closed. So we'll go to item 129 2017, um, domestic foul amendments. Um, Patty Grennan, uh, chair of the ordinance committee, is not here in order uh, in, uh, to introduce this, but uh, I will on her behalf. Um, so the ordinance committee uh, had met to discuss this after uh, the item being referred uh, to them by the full council in July. Um, this was after we'd received, as I think most of you remember, some complaints um, specifically about um, uh, chickens and so that was was the, the focus uh, of the work either Kathy or um, Caitlin I don't know if you want to add anything or mm, oh yeah sure um, first of all I definitely never thought bees were animals I do apologize but I also believe um, if you're raising bees for honey or whatever purpose it would fall under agriculture and you would have the right to farm law, well, that would trump the town ordinances, would be my understanding, if Matt wants to nod his head some more. <laughs> um, the problem with listing out the animals was how do we list and what do we list? What if we forget ferrets or what if we forget something? And then there's no other all-encompassing word to put other than animals. And so... I guess you could write excludes insects, but I, I'm not sure that's necessary because I really don't. I don't know how you would remedy that, other than I would think the right to farm law will overtake this ordinance, as it would if my pigs got loose. I mean. Okay. Did you want to add anything? Like I, I did speak with uh, Maureen O'Mara, the town planner, about yep. this uh, specifically for bees, and she felt that bees were uh, not, you know, didn't fall within, that, within the range of what this was trying to address. Um, other areas, you know, other animals, yes. Um, and dogs, as Scott had said, there's a whole specific category for dogs, uh, but other animals, yes, but not, uh, but not, she felt that bees would be exempted from that. The other, the other critters, I can't 
can't say as much you know, as Caitlin had said, a ferret or a cat or something along those lines. <laughs> it's more along the lines of being, you know, right. keeping your, pro your animals on your own property. And the language of the ordinance is that you won't purposely turn them onto your neighbor, basically the public way or the highway. Like you can't, if you're being a responsible pet owner, then that's not what this is trying to go after. It's the people who, you know, you're like, all right, chicken, go over onto their lawn. You know, it's, I try, let me bring, I can bring the language up. Because we left it specifically where it says, um, no owner or person having charge of an animal shall turn such animal onto or permit the same to go at large. So as long as you're not intentionally sending your animal, that, that's what this is designed for. That you need to find a way to contain your animal and, and bees are not intended to be covered under this. Kathy? Yeah, um, and th this, I think as Matt said, this was a reaction to um, an individual who was allowing her chickens to go to another property. When asked to remove them, she did and then they went back. Well, there was a state um, regulation, I guess, yes. that um, said, well, if it didn't happen more than so many times in 30 days, it was okay. And the neighbor said, no, it's not. I don't want these animals over here. And there was attempted um, resolution, my understanding is, with the police chief going and speaking with the animal owner and trying to get it resolved. And um, my understanding is that the animal owner felt that she was in her, within her rights. So this is a, um, an attempt to put some more teeth into if um, I allow my chickens onto Sarah's property and Sarah doesn't want them, Sarah has a remedy here with our ordinance to say, no, you can't leave them on my property. So um, the reason we deleted, as Jessica uh, has, um, sorry, Caitlin said is, you know, before we had horse, cow, ox, swine, goat, and other grazing animals, and um, it, that seemed a little bit old, and it didn't, cover other animals, and we weren't even sure what those other animals might be. Um, dogs aren't included because we have our own dog ordinance. So um, anyway, I, I'm, I'm in support of this. I don't think the intent was to, um, you know, keep somebody from ke ke keeping bees, but I guess if there was a concern, um, then at least the property owner who has a concern about something on their property could, you know, have some remedy. So, but I don't, as, just, as Caitlin said, I don't think this has to do with bees. This has to do with animals. I would suggest probably ones with four legs, <laughs> but we didn't say four legs, so. Or maybe two legs. Two. No, chickens have two legs. Never mind. <laughs> forget, forget the legs. <laughs> forget the legs. So, so I'm in support of this. Jessica. Did you talk about cats? That was where oh, it yes. started. That was what animal was, what prompted the other animals was, what about, because we were all about chickens and then we we're like, well, why are we making a chicken ordinance? What about the cat who wanders onto your lawn? If you, you know, and the whole premise is if without the, the neighbor's permission. So it's not that you need to go out and get, you know, even your neighbor to say, I give you permission to let your cat wander the neighborhood. But as soon as that neighbor says, I don't want your cat wandering, that's when this comes into play. It's so that it protects the property rights of the person who doesn't want your cat wandering around their lawn or chicken. But cat was what prompted us to start down the, why are we only trying to make this for chickens? Right. And, and Caitlin's point is, is well taken. I mean, maybe I have chickens in my yard and I don't want your cat over in my yard. But it's, it's more about, um, I've said to you, I don't want this to happen. And you ignore that request and, oh well, too bad. Um, right. Then I have some recourse to come back to, you know, um, the police department and say, you know, I told Caitlin, you know, five times, please keep your cat over there or whatever. Um, like with any ordinance, if we, go down the road and we find we've got some unintended consequences, we can certainly review it again. 
Yeah, I just was curious because I, you know, when people that have indoor outdoor cats, you know, it's not like you, know, you can't contain a cat the way you can a dog. That's, that's why I was wondering if you had had that discussion. We did. Yeah, okay. Um, Caitlin and Kathy, I'm glad you both just made the clarification. I was going to point it out that the, I think the salient part of the wording here is permission of the, without permission of the property owner. Right. Um, so I think um, a bit regardless of what grouping or classification of animals we're necessarily talking about, um, the onus is on, or, or not onus, I, I should say that the, the, the benefit is to the property owner who is aggrieved with whatever is taking place. So as you said, they have an action to fall back on. So um, as long as whatever animal is not bothering you, then that's, that's fine. So um, any other comments? Um, so with that, um, uh, the recommended action on this is to either adopt the amendments as presented. Um, I don't think that there's a need to refer back to the ordinance committee. Um, and I'm not sure that there's a need to refer it on to the next regularly scheduled meeting for action. So is there a motion um, on, this issue, on this item? Kathy? I move to accept the uh, change in the um, wording of the subsection of disturbing the peace, um, which we've listed as domestic fowl amendments, but it's in fact under our disturbing peace animal control part. So I move to accept as referred back to by the ordinance committee. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Caitlin, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you very much. Next item, uh, we'll have a public hearing on general assistance appendices. Um, Matt, do you want, Matt or Deb, do you want to introduce us? Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. This is an annual uh, housekeeping for these appendices. We receive them from the Maine Municipal Association and Annually, they will provide us updates as to where changes have taken place from one year to the next. Uh, it's an annual adoption that takes place, and it happens to happen it happens to fall in October. So, uh, it's that's pretty much it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, with that, um, I'm not sure if there's anybody here that wants to speak on it, but we'll open up the floor for the public hearing. Same rules as before. Come to the podium. About three minutes. State your name and your address, please. So the public hearing is now open. Does anybody wish to speak on this? Hot topic. <laughs> Seeing none, the public hearing is now closed. Item number 130-2017, the General Assistance <coughs> Appendices. So as Matt just uh, described to us, these are um, an annual uh, grouping of updates that uh, we're to act on. So I'll be looking for a motion to adopt the General Assistance Ordinance Appendix A through D, as included here in the packet. So moved. Thank you, Caitlin. Is there a second? Sarah, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Great. Item number 131-2017, polystyrene, poly polystyrene foam and plastic bag ordinances. Um, as I see Caitlin walking away, um, I will uh, entertain, well, no, I don't have to do anything because you've, you've already previously been recruited. Never mind. Thank you. So just a reminder that Caitlin has recused herself from this item. Um, so again, in um, Councilor Grennan's stead, I will introduce this. Um, and I sat in on the um, uh, uh, ordinance committee meetings that um, handled this item um, because uh, Councilor Jordan had uh, stepped aside. Um, so what uh, is being brought forth here today uh, is uh, the product of um, I think some good and collaborative back and forth work, um, including the town planner, the ordinance committee, and the recycling committee, of whom I see several members here tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, and uh, modeling um, the basis of the ordinance language for both of these off of um, similar ordinances that have passed in neighboring communities, um, the ordinance committee is bringing forward a recommendation um, to uh, ban poly polystyrene foam with several exceptions that are noted uh, and then also recommend introducing a five cent charge per single use carry out bag um, and uh, the recommendation here uh, tonight is that we refer this on to uh, a public hearing 
for our November 6th um, regular meeting in a few weeks. So um, Matt or Kara, um, I don't know if either one of you would like to come forward to speak um, as you were instrumental in. Um, it's Kara Law from the Recycling Committee. Hi there, good evening. Um, so at the last meeting, we were asked to look into uh, applying the bag ordinance to retail businesses that were not food businesses. And I just wanted to report that the committee has done outreach to six, well, we've gone to 19 total businesses in town, which includes six dental, medical, or veterinary practices, um, as well as um, retail shops, uh, hair care, nail care, any place that we could think of that was a business in town, um, we visited, and 16 of those we were able to reach somebody or able to leave a letter that we drafted describing the proposed changes to the ordinance. Um, I would say, broadly speaking, there, was, there were some people who were in support of the ordinance in general, although, and either said, it doesn't apply to my business, um, or there were some folks, particularly at gift shops, I would say, and more of your traditional retail vendors, who were concerned about the impact that this ordinance would have on their business. Um, some of the, the concerns had to do with the idea that part of what we are trying to accomplish is to instill new habits where people bring reusable bags for their shopping. And while surrounding communities do have these ordinances for food stores, many of us have already developed those habits, but we may not have developed those habits for places that we visit only on occasion. Um, some of those examples were places you might visit just seasonally, like the Christmas tree farm, that people might not think to bring a bag. <clears throat> and there was concern that there would be ill will by the customers who might be angry that they need to pay a fee for a bag where they didn't expect to. So there were definitely some concerns by some of these retail non-food businesses. Um, that's in contrast to the food retailers who were by and large very supportive of both of the proposed amendments. Thank you very much. Yep, go ahead. Um, I'm curious if this includes bags that the cleaners put over clothes, because that would eclipse all other bag use. Uh, it's, a spe it's specific bags with handles that are used to carry out products, so that would be exempt. There were a substantial number of these businesses, I'd have to count, that said, this doesn't apply to me, we don't use bags. Um, so it really was just a small handful, but it was mainly people who have customers, who also who are customers from out of town. So for example, people who are visiting Fort Williams from a cruise ship or on a tour bus who may not be familiar with local ordinances. They might come and not be prepared with a reusable bag and might be upset at having to pay for one. All right. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Kara. Thank you to the Recycling Committee. Thank you, Maureen. Um, so with that, um, I'll be looking for a motion to set this item to a public hearing at the November 6th Council meeting. Sarah? I uh, move that we set the um, poly foam, polystyrene foam and plastic bag ordinances to a public hearing at our regular November meeting. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Short-handed folks, somebody has to raise. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Kathy. I was reading the comments from somebody about that. Yeah. All those in favor? All right, is there any discussion? I'm sorry. All those in favor? Great. Thank you very much. Next up is item number 132-2017, a request to rezone 27 Fowler Road. Um, Give everybody a second here. Hi, Carolyn. Thanks. Yep. So, um, Carolyn Jordan from the Planning Board, um, could you please introduce this for us? All right. The um, request to rezone uh, 27 Fowler Road from uh, RA to BB was, has been before the Planning Board since April. Uh, we began discussing it in workshops. We had many, many discussions, many discussions with the owner and uh, opportunities for public input and it was a really tough tough decision uh, there's there are pros and there are cons as there are with all decisions um, this property does abut as a matter of fact the uh, 
the current BB zone has a right of way through this property. Um, so that, that weighed on one side, but in the final call, the uh, planning board decided not to recommend uh, this change. Um, the concerns were uh, varied. There was concern about setting a precedent for all abutting property owners around uh, the BB district. Um, there was concern uh, about the um, additional traffic that could be created by this. Uh, the uh, residents of Fowler Road spoke about the existing tr commercial traffic and concerns about adding to that. And there were concerns about um, violations that were seen during our site walk. Um, and, uh, and the final result was, the vote was six to one, not to recommend this change. So. Thank you for that introduction. Um, oh. At this point, invite anybody from the public that wishes to speak on this to come forward. <clears throat> State your name and uh, sure. please limit your comments to about three um, minutes. My name is Nell Hanna. Again, I live at the Great Pond Terrace Condo Association on Fellow Road. Um, I think I was here at the planning board hearing and I think um, it is m much of what was just said is absolutely the case. I think what wasn't mentioned is the issue of safety um, because this residential neighborhood um, already has big trucks from the gravel company that drive by a lot. Um, this would add more trucks and it's less the traffic issue than the safety issue of all these trucks going down this road. A lot of children live on this road. Um, there are dog walkers, there are kids riding bikes, there are adults riding bikes, there are pedestrians and it's a very, the road is very sort of wiggly, there are a lot of blind turns, so I just feel like it, it, it would not be, um, it would be really problematic to have a company that would also generate trucks from the road and, and substantial trucks. Um, what also concerns me is that given the potential impacts of this, this business on the road, the violations on this property that have not been remedied um, it would really set a low bar for other requests seeking zoning changes to business on Fowler Road. Um, it's, it is a very much a residential neighborhood, and I, for one, and I know there are others, would really like to keep it that way. And, um, you know, I, so I, I would ask you to uh, consider these concerns. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Brad Pearson. I'm the one actually applying for this. Um, I wanted to touch on uh, last month's meeting about the planning board's discussion uh, about the traffic. Um, as I see it, I guess I'm getting negative feedback from the amount of traffic that I would add. Uh, and I'm, we put in when we wrote up what we were planning to change within um, my landscape contractor yard that we would be doing trucks like everyday pickups, um, small rack bodies that we see on a normal basis around town, um, nothing large scale dump truck wise requiring a class B or C or B or A license, um, pretty much anything that any of us could drive on a daily basis. So it's not, I guess I'm not adding maybe a couple half a dozen trucks to the road um, that we normally travel anyways on a daily basis um, and when I look next door and see that the concern is of large trucks but there are no limits of how many trucks can go in and out of the existing pit um, as it is I mean there's sometimes I see I sat down back and within every two or three minutes I had a truck going across our easement um, either LP Murray Sun's trucks or any single contractor that is using the uh, Murray's pit. So I guess I'm being limited to not getting a rezone because of which trucks are being added, but next door he can have as many trucks, he could do up to 100 trucks a day if he wanted to, in and out of there, and no, have no restriction. Um, so I feel as though 
the traffic situation that's currently there is an issue that is could be addressed but I don't think I'm going to be adding to that as we travel out on a daily basis as it is um, coming from out of town. Um, the violations that are currently there, uh, there's dirt that I piled up that was actually spread out across the entire yard. Um, yes, it was going into neighbors, one the gravel pit, one my other neighbor that can easily be addressed within probably a day's worth of time because that's how long it took me to actually build the berm that's there right now. Um, so the violations I saw as something that could be a contingency of the rezone. Um, so that's kind of where I was just thrown off of a vote to not accept it because of a violation that can easily be addressed within a day's time. Um, and that would be something I'd see an ordinance committee could address and they're not going to rezone it until those are addressed. Uh, besides that, I just trying to make this work so I can be back in town where, where I was born and raised. So, and uh, try to save my 20 minutes out of town to come right back into town. Um, and just the ease, there was one concern of this is only gonna benefit me personally. With anybody trying to rezone or do something is pretty much for their sole purpose is it's not for the benefit to hundreds of others in my situation, yes, it is for hundreds of others because we respond 24-7 to house calls for uh, the snowbirds that are gone during the winter. It's my time. Yeah. Um, so being in town, being super responsive to snow plowing, um, late calls for rescue calls because we've done that plenty of times. I'm on the fire department, so we respond to that. Um, so it's just a faster response time for us to get to job sites if need to be done for alarm calls or break-ins or whatever like that to meet up with uh, the officers. But I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak on this? Seeing none, um, is before we open up to discussion, is there a motion on the floor? Go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, I move that the council um, um, I'm trying to think of how I want to say this. Uh, affirm agree, the recommendation of the planning board. Yeah, um, I was going to say Accept agree the to the, the recommendation of the planning board um, to not recommend um, the change in the zoning to rezone 27 Fowler Road. Is there a second? Jessica, any discussion? Kathy. Um, I am concerned that there are unresolved notices of violation um, in terms of the property expansion that was done six to eight years ago. And those notices of violation go back to 2012 and are still unresolved. Um, I hear also that there is concern about additional um, trucks and I can appreciate um, traveling Fowler oftentimes myself that it is a narrow and small road in a residential neighborhood. But my biggest concern is the violations. Um, we got an email from somebody, I don't remember the name, and suggested that um, this was a chance to pick on somebody who was longtime town resident. I would suggest that being a long town long time town resident myself, um, rules apply to all of us. Doesn't matter how long you've lived here. I don't care if you've been here a week or a hundred years or six hundred or what is it, Caitlin? Sixteen hundred and something. Um, <laughs> Um, it concerns me that these violations have gone unresolved for such a long period of time. And uh, I would suggest that if somebody's asking the planning board or some or the town council to make a change, that they need to have um, their uh, house in order. And it does not appear that that's the case. So. 
um, I will be voting in favor of the recommendation from the planning board. Sir? Um, I will support the motion too, but for a different reason. I really um, appreciate the work that Anything Goes does. I think they're invaluable to the town. I think many, many people rely on them, employ them. They do great service. I think they're a huge addition to our town. Um, so I celebrate what you guys do. I don't know about the property and violations. I'm just saying big picture. I think it's great that we have this, what used to be small business and now is, I'd say, a bigger business. Congratulations to you guys. I totally cheer it and support it and I wish there were a way that we could accommodate your desire to come back to Cape, that maybe there was somewhere else that you would be in conformance or some other property that you could use. Um, because in no way is my vote to p penalize what you guys are doing. Because um, again, I, I, I appreciate it. My, the basis for my vote is that I don't really agree with rezones. Um, and my reason for that is that it opens up a precedent for all kinds of people to request re rezones anywhere near a business district, and that becomes a really slippery slope because all of a sudden you're expanding business districts on any side of the district, and so the delineation between what's between zones becomes very blurry. Someone can say, "Well, how come the Pearsons got to do it and I don't get to do it?" And I just believe that we have zones for a reason, and I think people who buy property in a residential zone should have a reasonable reassurance that it will remain residential and by that relatively peaceful and quiet. I understand that the gravel pit complicates that equation and that that's a non-conforming use because he was there before the neighborhood. Um, I, so there's really no remedy to that. But my point is, I think whenever possible we sh should avoid rezoning things on the edge of other districts because it suddenly makes the line permeable and changeable and that makes people lose confidence in um, a property that they've invested a lot, a lot of money in. So again, in no way am I criticizing your business. I think it's fabulous. I just, I just philosophically don't really agree with reasons. So I'll be supporting the motion. But I, I wish you guys another solution that could accommodate your needs because I do think having businesses in Cape is great. Other discussion, Jessica. Yep, um, I'm supporting the motion. I'm not in favor of allowing this. <clears throat> property rezone. I've read through all the planning board's documentation of what they've been doing and, and once again I'm deeply appreciative of all the work they put into everything. Um, given especially the, the makeup of Fowler Road, it's a very old road. The Murray's Pit has been there for oh, I don't know how many decades. Um, but I don't think that, that this uh, road or neighborhood um, personally should should have any any zoning changes. I think residential is the way it needs to stay. Um, I, I was also very impressed with all the the um, uh, code violations that have been long standing, um, which certainly doesn't help the situation. But I, I don't think that that this is um, this would be a a benefit to the neighborhood in any way. Other discussion? Caitlin. Just weigh in. Um, my biggest problem is those four houses that create the residential zone between the two business districts. If, if I would have no problem with this rezone if we could have made it, you know, clean, cleaner. So, like, you're going to, not that you having the five, no, no, your five houses, but it, it does create a, a change to those four houses that moved there, not expecting to have a business district right next to it. So similar to what Sarah was saying about the, the rezoning, I'd feel more comfortable if you had, you know, that whole space and we were going to rezone the whole thing because all that land needed to be business district. Um, I think it's unfortunate that the violations are there. I mean, hindsight. It would have been much better to have all that cleaned up and then we would have been able to walk in with a, you know, cleaner application, I guess you could say. You know, they, they kind of nicked you from the beginning, and that's too bad. But I'm only hesitant about those four people because I, I really do take property rights into a huge consideration. And you have the property rights too, unfortunately, 
we don't have the right you want written into the ordinance right now. But we need more business area in town in general and smacking it unfortunately right in the middle of that residential lot there doesn't create a solution. Any other discussion? I don't really have anything additional to add. Um, I, I, I don't think that there's um, an enormous adverse impact to the um, addition of this commercial activity given what's surrounding it. Um, I agree with you, Caitlin, about the island of four homes that are sort of sandwiched in being um, being problematic, but in so much as that this would be um, not expanding further into the more residential section of um, of the Fowler Road uh, area, but instead in the opposite direction towards um, towards the town center district, um, you know, it would, in all other ways, be I think, um, you know, a reasonable um, a reasonable accepted reasonably accepted um, alteration. And I I I, I don't necessarily ag agree with a dramatic increase in adverse traffic um, um, that some people have um, stated. I too share the concerns about the um, the violations, and um, so I, I'm on side with with all the other opinions that have been rendered. So, with that, I'll uh, raise, call the question. All those in favor of the motion on the floor to accept the planning board's recommend, recommendation to not approve this request for uh, a rezone. Opposed. Okay. Thank you. Um, item number 133-2017, we have a recommendation to change the existing delineation of the off-leash area in Fort Williams Park. Mark Russell from the Fort Williams Advisory Committee is here. Mark, do you want to come forward to tee this up at all? I think I'm just here to answer the questions that you might ask. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, what? Do you want a motion? Yep, that'd be great. I move we refer the recommendation to change the existing delineation of the off leach area in Fort Williams to the Ordinance Committee for review and recommendation. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Caitlin, any discussion? <laughs> Kathy. Um, yeah, I, I'm of a couple of opinions. One, I'm not sure that it needs to go to the Ordinance Committee, but if that's the will of the council, that will what it is. Um, I am very concerned about the proposal. Um, first of all, uh, I'm having a hard time understanding it, and so I'm wondering um, how, other, how dog owners are going to understand it. Um, it's, it's like from April 15th to June 15th you can do this, from August 15th to October 15th you can do that. Um, I am concerned about the um, ability to legislate this. Who's going to handle this? Um, and I would prefer to have a leash law at Fort Williams for all dogs in all areas. Um, I say this because I do know that there have been um, instances, I had one myself, where a dog off the leash came running at me. Uh, my dog happened to be on the leash. Uh, this was a big dog, it was very scary. I picked my dog up. The owner was running after the dog saying, don't pick your dog up, don't pick your dog up, she'll just get madder. And I ended up having to, I wouldn't say pick this dog, but push this dog away from me leg and I was scared. My dog was terrified. Um, I see no reason to have dogs off leash at Fort Williams ever. That's my opinion. Um, I also think it's a lot cleaner. I think that if there is a dog off leash, then the dog owner, um, the, the person who sees the dog off leash can, can talk with the um, park ranger. If it's not resolved, the park ranger would resolve it and or the owners asked to leave with their dog. Um, I don't see any reason to have dogs running around off leash. And so my point is, I don't see any reason to send this to ordinance. I am, would be perfectly happy to vote on it tonight. Um, I'm not sure what ordinance is going to do with it, but I know that 
being on ordinance and looking at this language, um, I, I just, I think it's very messy and I don't see any reason to, to do it. So um, there's a motion and a second. Um, I will probably vote against it in hopes that we can take a full vote on this tonight, but if I, if I lose, I, I know how that goes. Sarah? Is it possible that the Ordinance Committee could consider all these possibilities, like what Kathy's saying? I mean, I don't know anything about it because I don't lock my dog in the fort. Um, I suspect there's probably passionate feelings about this, just like when Robinson Woods tried to impose leash laws, it was quite the, com quite the process. Would you guys be open to this conversation? Like, like obviously to address this, but also other possibilities and figure it out for us? Because usually what happens on ordinance, I mean, we were sent chickens and we did animals. Yeah, so I'm happy to send to ordinance so you guys can. Mark, do you want to address some of Kathy's questions? Would you mind coming? Oh, thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Yep, thank you. Wasn't that I didn't want to speak, but I didn't want to get in the way either. Just a little bit of history. We've been talking about this uh, at our committee for a year the, uh, the, with, uh, with dog owners and uh, amongst members of the community and the, and the committee as a whole. Uh, we've been very sensitive to the needs of people who walk their dogs in the park. Um, we ran across a language issue ourselves in the current ordinance defining what was off leash and what was not off leash. I think we resolved that. Um, Bob Malley helped us with that. Um, and we came down to, uh, at the end of the day, uh, breaking this down like we do most of the things that we do in the park, it's a safety issue for us. We don't believe that dogs should be allowed on a field where children play sports. It's very simple. And um, we were sensitive to, I personally was sensitive to that from day one, but I think we all came around to, this, to the issue that we don't want dogs playing on any field in, in the community where young children play sports, uh, or, or older children for that matter. Um, we're very sensitive to the needs of the dog walking community in the fort. Um, we have some issues. Um, I think. Lots of towns and lots of parks and lots of woods have issues with people who walk dogs and let their dogs run free. Um, and we have, a, we have an enforcement issue, obviously, um, because we don't have anybody to enforce it. We share a dog, we share an animal control officer with the town of South Portland who's made 88 calls in a couple of months. You could probably make 88 calls in a couple of weeks out there. Um, what we decided was to eliminate dogs from the multi-purpose playing field at the fort during the seasons in which children play on the field are scheduled to play on the field. Um, currently, we eliminate dogs from that field with a fence. Uh, it seems to work. It's a plastic, it's plastic police fence. Uh, it's pretty ugly when you think of all the other beautiful things in the park, but it works for our purposes and it works for the dog walkers' purposes. Um, when we decided to bring some, some finality to this, uh, we even talked about fencing in the field. Um, I think we actually got a, you know, a preliminary quote on what it would cost. It cost about $25,000. Um, we decided to take this step and push the issue by sending it to the Ordinance Committee and having them discuss it at a, at a level above us. Um, and we worked for quite a while at our last meeting just to come up with the wording that we did. We wanted to look at the specific dates when the field was scheduled for use, and we wanted when we prohibited dogs on the field during those periods of time, we wanted to give the dog walkers, um, because we're sensitive to their needs, we wanted to give um, them additional space in the park to let the dogs run free. And uh, so we proposed um, to change the boundaries of the off-leash area and include a portion of the green, which is down uh, by the lighthouse. Um, currently, dogs are prohibited from running freely on the green. Um, they have to be leashed as soon as they come down the road around 
um, one of the one of the old uh, I forget what batteries. You're batteries. Batteries. Excuse me. But um, there's a water fountain down there. The dogs are usually uh, um, um, leashed up. They have water. And we decided to extend the boundary. We decided to suggest that the boundary be extended to a portion of the green. Um, we think it makes sense. We invited uh, a dog walking group to speak to us. Several did at our last meeting. This seemed to be a reasonable compromise. So that's the history. Um, it's not one meeting. Um, it's been going on for a long time. And we just decided that this is the time to um, bring it to uh, bring it to you in one form or the other. Um, just a personal note here. Um, I don't think dogs should be allowed on any playing field at any time. Um, just because we're blocking it off for, this is my personal view. Um, um, it's a safety thing for me. It's very plain and simple. Um, and um, I compromised with the rest of my committee, and this is what we came up with. So, Mark, I just wanted to add one more thing. Correct me if I'm wrong, but in the existing um, designated areas that we have today, and some of the maps that we have pertaining to the fort, some of that stuff is actually not up to date too. So that also, this we, was also somewhat prompted by that. As yeah, well. it was, and we again, I think I mentioned just a little bit earlier. Um, we had one member of our committee who did thought he found some inconsistencies in the way it was worded and what was actually used. And I think Bob Malley set us straight and said, "No, this seems to be right." Okay. Um, so um, we would have proposed a change there if we hadn't, you know found religion. So um, I think I think we're in a good spot here. Um, and I think this is headed in the right direction. And I'm certainly sensitive to your needs. Um, um, I'm there every day without a dog. And um, I, 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 I think this is, you know, headed in the right direction. So I have some questions for Mark. Go ahead, Kathy. Um, so you talked about dog walking communities, and I, I think about how Robinson Woods now has a leash law. And um, I think maybe uh, Beach in South Portland has changed, uh, Willard, Willard, Willard yeah. thank you, has changed some of their um, requirements for dogs. And I'm wondering if that's bringing more people to Fort Williams with their dogs because that might be one of the only places that they can let their dogs run free. Um, you talk about dog walking communities. Are we talking about residents of Cape Elizabeth or are we talking about um, other people who may be bringing dogs to our fort um, because it's a place where the dogs can run free? So those are sort of my... Uh, the answer to all those questions is yes. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about Cape Elizabeth, Cape Elizabeth residents, residents from out of town. We actually had dog walking community people at our meeting from South Portland. Um, they're there for a couple of reasons. It's a nice place to walk your dog. It's a nice place to come and see a lighthouse. It's a nice place to have a picnic. Um, it's a nice place to go for a walk. And that's why a lot of people come there. And it's the same problem that we see throughout the park. This just happens to be associated with this corner of the park and dogs. Thank you. I, I, I hear what you're saying, um, and I wouldn't say that I was um, trying to say that people from other towns can't come to our park. I wouldn't even imply that. But if they're coming there so that they can allow um, dogs to run free, um, that gives me pause. Um, and I, I don't disagree with you on you know having dogs not on fields and so forth. What I do disagree with is having dogs run free at all in the park. And that's where I'm coming from, and that's probably where I am going to come from. Um, I just think that humans um, are more important than dogs. Dogs are animals. And as sweet as they are, and I think there's somebody here that has a sweet dog. Um, mine was sweet. But um, they're still animals, and animals need to be controlled and we control them with leashes when they're with other people in public areas. So um, 
that's just the way I personally feel. And I will, you know, as I said, I will support this going to ordinance and, and I would not suggest that you didn't do a lot of work on this. I'm, I'm involved in another um, community right now and dogs are the issue. <laughs> So, um, yeah, that seems to always be one of those things that's sort of on top on the list. So, anyway, thank you. Yep. Thank you for answering my questions. Jessica. Uh, first, my first question is for, the, for Matt. Um, I'm not sure this needs to go to ordinance in that would this, would this be a full ordinance policy under, uh, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not even sure that it, I mean, I don't object to it going to ordinance. I'm just not sure it needs to because there's a park policy like other policies that the park has for how it's, you know, administrated. It, this may not need to be an ordinance, is what I'm getting at. I, I so that's one the, question. Yeah, some, I think it's under the dogs section of chap, okay. chapter 7, dog section 7-1-7. Seven -seven. Does uh, it dogs currently address okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, so that's why it's coming back over to the ordinance committee. So that's part of our thank dog you. ordinance? Is yeah. that what, okay, okay, thank you. I haven't looked at that. I, I've read all the min minutes, uh, read all your minutes, Mark. <laughs> I know how long you've been working on it and what's yes. been happening. Yep. Yep. Yes. Uh, you work on some things for a long time, too. I didn't yeah. mean to uh, yeah. oh, no. overstep yeah. so, there. So I have comments for yep. uh, Mark and the rest of the council. I, I, have, I am a very frequent, not in the summer, because, you know, for those of us who live here, trying to get to, into Fort Williams in the summer is, is, is you know, we usually wait until the summer's over. But I, walk, I have two dogs, and I walk them there frequently um, when it's not summertime and this includes all winter uh, I I would like to see uh, on leash at all times because this I think is it's a it's a hygiene issue it's a safety issue it's also an administration issue I mean it's very simple if it's on leash all the time we're not if we if we went down that road we're not preventing anybody from walking their dogs there but I don't think that you know we have a, some sort of inherent need to allow people to let their dogs run free. I mean, we've had incidences where people have been bitten, and there have been dog fights. Um, I think that I would keep them off the playing fields, even when you know walking the dogs. They should not be in those playing fields. I mean, as a physical therapist, I can tell you, if a child is running and playing in a soccer tournament, slips on dog doo doo, and could completely torque his knee or destroy it. And I've seen that. So I, I really, I think that personally the time has come to just say like other areas the, around us, you, you'd love to have you walk your dogs, but they must be on leashes at all times. I think it's a safety issue, and if we keep it simple like that, it's a lot easier for park rangers to, uh, to deal with it. Right. Just on a leash all, at all times, pure and simple. So that, that's what I would, uh, would like to see, and again, you know, we're not preventing people from walking their dogs. We just want them on leashes. Or 15 dogs. <laughs> but so let's mean, send it to ordinance. I think we should send it to ordinance. Yeah. And let them I mean, well, we, we have to, which I didn't realize. I hadn't looked at our ordinance. And but so this will be back. We'll be talking about it more. Yeah. And ordinance now has heard yeah. the breadth of mm -hmm. range of yeah. possibilities. <laughs> uh, Caitlin, did you have any comments? Or? I, I wanted to weigh in to say, while well, we've um, initiated conversation about longer range planning for the fort, and the possibility of hiring for a park director and things like that. Um, I personally will be taking a more cautious view of changes like this, um, absent any, any wider strategy or, or opinion of somebody who will then be um, actually managing the park on a daily basis. Um, so um, I, I think it makes sense to refer to ordinance, but also um, even if it comes back from ordinance quickly, um, you know, we'll have to take action on it, but, but I, would, I would very much like to be able to have, um, you know, that sort of wider view and input um, that I know that we've all, from recent discussion, been anxious to, to begin discussing and, and soliciting. So, Mark, did yeah, you Yeah, I just want to maybe? piggyback on your comment here because you and I have started this process. Um, the key from my standpoint to uh, all of this is enforcement. There currently isn't any. And that's neither here nor there right now. Um, and I would hope at some point in the future with uh, you know, talks going forward about a park administrator or a park supervisor or whatever it is, that he has the ability to enforce the rules. 
Um, this isn't the only rule that there's a problem with. This just happens to be the one before you right now. So, so I think, you know, just to punctuate it, I, I think that this is, I appreciate yours and the committee's work. I think that this is an artful solution to address sort of the current situation. I think any adaptation, in my view, to, um, you know, you know, significantly modifying the current use, um, I think we should take in a, in a wider view discussion like that. But so uh, with that, uh, if there's no other discussion, call the question. All those in favor of referring this matter on to the Ordinance Committee? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. Next up is item number 134-2017. Uh, consideration of a standing renewal energy renewal I think this should be renewable, should be renewable. sorry yes. renewable energy committee um, <clears throat> we had um, previously uh, discussed at earlier workshops in both May and then uh, most recently last month or earlier this month rather um, the one of the recommendations that was put forth by the alternative energy committee in their report to us um, was to consider the creation of a standing committee on renewable energy. Um, so the recommended action here is to refer this on to the Ordinance Committee for review and consideration. I'll be looking for a motion for that. Sarah? I move that we refer the consideration of a standing renewal energy committee to the Ordinance Committee for review and recommendation. Is there a second? Second. Caitlin, any discussion? Oh, sorry. Yeah. I thought um, you were raising your hand. No, that's <laughs> point, that was pointing. Very, very <laughs> meek. Sorry, no, that was pointing. <laughs> yeah, I, I was alluding to this in the workshop, but, and, you know, I know this is going to ordinance, but we've got two ordinance committee members here. Well, one. It's going to be here. Yeah. Um, so I know it's like you were saying at the workshop that it, this will be, however it's crafted, will be crafted in the same manner as all our so other boards. Yeah. That's yeah. how, I would, how right. I would pursue it. And I just wanted to point out that in this original uh, document, it has a description of committee powers and duties. The committee has no powers. It's, right. It always, it's, uh, just, it's every, I'll make sure that's going right, to be In every, boards in, in every <coughs> section of the boards and committee's ordinance, it's like yeah. we overemphasize advisory. Yeah. Advisory. Advisory. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, there, there are several committees that have powers, but those are quasi-judicial and those powers. Right, but that's what I mean yeah. these ones. It's yeah. like you basically yeah. have nothing to do with what we tell you to do. All right. Thank you. That's all. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Great. Thank you very much. Back to Fort Williams. We've got a recommendation from the um, Fort Williams Park Committee to approve a requested use for the 2018 Walk to Cure Arthritis on Sunday, June 3rd. Um, contingencies are listed here. Is there a motion to approve their recommendation? Okay, Jessica, so is there a second? Sarah, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Great. That concludes our regular agenda. If there's, um, I'm sorry, was I, I didn't, didn't think, did you want to speak about it? Public comment? No, sorry. Your, uh, <laughs> My mistake. I didn't mean to rush through it, and thank you very much. Sorry, for, that was the last thing on the agenda. Thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you. Um, Could have done that. If there's no nobody else from the public that's wishing to speak on anything not on the agenda, oh, Caitlin. Uh, no, I just finished that. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Seeing none, motion to adjourn. No, okay. actually, I no? have oh, okay. a question about. Um, our next steps for after our executive session, I would kind of like to know what the plan is going forward. Are we, since we switched our next meeting to the first week of November, are uh, like, you to request something be put on that agenda, or are we thinking we want to schedule another workshop? I just wanted to know what the thought was. Sarah? I think given that's our last meeting before the council change, council changes and getting two more people educated on this will be a 
might need to ask. I, I think it would be great for us to make a decision. It's nice to have a deadline finally. I think it'd be great for us to make a decision in that November meeting, but I also agree with whoever it was, Penny, that said, now we need a conversation to follow up all that we learned, I think. So I would be in favor of scheduling one more, much as I hate coming in night meetings, scheduling one more meeting between now and the November town council meeting for us to all as a group hash out what we heard and try to see if we can come up with some solution that we can all live with. Other comments? I mean, it could be a morning meeting and lunch meeting, I don't care. I just feel like we need another conversation. I, I mean, I think there was a lot that we took in um, in executive session. Um, I don't, I, I think we probably do need a collective um, conversation amongst us, um, probably in the form of a workshop prior to introducing something for the November agenda. So, so that we can hear each other's opinions based on what we've just learned, so, which we haven't had the chance really to do, I don't think. So the question is, do we want a workshop where the public's there and they have time to speak before and all that, or do we want it? They're, they're there anyway. They have yeah. to, you have yeah. to, but you limit it. We don't have a purpose to go into further executive session oh, okay. on it, so. Um, yeah, there's no to reason to have extended public comment at the workshop beyond the 15 minutes. We yeah. can right. limit Technically, it by that. rules of our meetings, I will point out, too, that um, there's language, I don't have it specifically in front of me, that addresses if, you, if we're not receiving comment that is new and different mm -hmm. and from right, people exactly. who we've, from whom we've not heard, mm -hmm. that it's at the discretion of the chair to even recognize, um, you know, I folks for that opportunity the chair to comment. To use so. That power. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, th I think I made my point clear at our workshop last month, um, I, you know, which was still well attended, I think, by a lot of interested parties that We've heard people's opinions. We we get it. We we've we've gotten a lot of input, um, and I'm appreciative of all that. I, you know, I know that it's you know been you know difficult to wade through all that, but I mean I think it's important that we hear that and digest it and things like that. But at this point, I think based on um, some of the very specific things we've just learned earlier this evening, um, that we do need to. Um, discuss collectively, um, you know, what our positions are and so on. Um, we can do that in the form of a workshop and have that be the, the predicate to the whatever whatever we ultimately then decide to put on the agenda for number over six. Um, October 30th is, uh, is open in here. Is what? Is open. Um, that Monday night, the 30th is open here. If you wanted to grab that. What, what's the day of the week? Monday the 30th? Monday. Yeah, Monday, October 30th. <clears throat> okay with me. That should work for me too. Yeah. I think it's okay. I, I my calendar's at home, but I think it's okay. Do we wear our costumes? <laughs> <laughs> I'll bring candy. <laughs> Jessica? Yep. Does, does that work for you? Yeah, as long as it's a seven. I'll be running from class. But. Okay. Um we, I mean, we can set it for 7.15 if you want a few extra minutes. To no, I mean, I, I made it, what, like yeah. four minutes after okay. or Skinny your teeth. That'd be fine. Okay. Um, so would somebody like to make a motion to set a workshop for October 30th? I don't know if we need to have a motion, actually. No, but you really don't. I don't think we do, yeah. no. Okay. So, um, so October 30th, October 30th, we'll have a workshop uh, with the agenda of discussing um, what action to take at our November 6th meeting. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Anything now else? Now motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Sarah, any discussion? All those in favor? Great. Thank you very much.